Well, you know, sometimes I, I think that God's are against me. <laughs> I have to tell you this story. Uh, as many of you may know, last week when I was going to GB News, I, I travelled about 300 miles on train after get a car journey before that. Well, I was, t you know, and last week um, I, I took a small train, an earlier train than my normal one, because the normal one was cancelled. And um, I'm afraid we the train killed somebody, and I was um, a bit of a witness to that, and uh, very upsetting. And um, so this week I arrived at the station and checked, and my normal train was on time. But before it, half an hour before it, this little train, the one carriage train, was leaving. That wasn't going all the way to Paddington, so I don't have to take that now. I'll wait. So I let that train go, obviously, and get on my normal train, which takes me all the way to Paddington. Uh, and I'm sitting on the train, and after a while the conductor comes and says, sorry, we can't leave. The train in front of us, that's the same one as last week, I'm afraid has um, had a fatality there on the line. So uh, it's not funny because obviously somebody died, and again another driver has been impacted by probably another suicide um, thing. But um, I then contacted the studio and said, I can't make it. You know, it's going to be hours. This, the whole line is going to be closed for hours. And then I had to had think because there were two ladies by me who needed to get to London for a medical appointment. And I thought, why don't we drive past it and pick up a station the other side of the fatality, as it were. And we looked at the trains. Yeah, we could do it. So we rushed off to another station the other side of the fatality and waited for a train. And yes, I got to London an hour later, but I allow for that anyway, because I'm so often there's so much goes on. So I arrived late and when I came into the studio um, in the green room, I met the chairman of the Labour Party, which was a very nice chap, actually. And he, he said something to me interesting because he knew of me. And he said, Paul, um, pol us politicians, when we look at data, we look for data to support what we think. And I said, yeah, but he said, but how do you scientists look? You look at it differently. So I said, yeah, we look to the data to see what story the data is telling us. What is it telling us? The data is in charge, not our opinions. And that is the fundamental difference, actually. And I think putting it that way, I'll use that in future. So even a discussion with someone who's maybe the other, totally on the other side of politics to me, can be very useful, and he was a very nice chap. But then um, Jim Dale hadn't turned up, and so the producer came and said, don't worry, he's appearing online. Yeah, fine. So I came into the studio, and we both, Nana and I, thought he was going to appear any second. Well, we got to the end of the interview, and it was just me, and Nana was trying to play the devil's advocate to balance things as she has to do. And so it was just me. I wish I'd have known that beforehand, because I could have prepared something that could have used the time more effectively. But I didn't. Um, but it did allow me to get a few messages across. And so now I'm going to show it. And now, now I'm going to do a dissection of myself to show you what, I, you know, what I'm trying to explain. And it's forced in me something else. It, it, it forced me to bring to the forefront um, basically what I did when I was in Romania in the Parliament building there, uh, which is a speech uh, or a talk taking you from scratch to understanding the science to understanding the con. And you got to, I, I, that talk was balanced for 20 minutes. So I'm, what I'm going to do is redo that talk, um, some better graphs, better maybe things like that, and uh, and do that and publish that. Uh, and I think it's the it explains the difference in science between us and the alarmists that I try to do very simply in this program you're about to see. But I'd like to explain it properly, which I couldn't do. But I am angling and pushing for more and more time on GB News and um, gradually, like wearing down the granite with rain, you know, you may get there, as it were. So here, here we are, Paul Burgess dissecting himself. Good afternoon. It's 24 minutes after three o'clock. If you've just tuned in, welcome on board. I'm Nana Aquir. This is GB News. We are the People's Channel. It's time now for Climate Control, where we unpick the debate around the climate. And on the menu, Tata Steel Giant has uh, confirmed plans to close blast furnaces on its Port Talbot site. That's in South Wales. Now, this, of course, could lead to the loss of up to 2,800 jobs. The furnaces will uh, transition to electric arc technology, which require fewer workers to maintain. But it's 
Is this shift to cleaner, so-called cleaner energy and net zero, is it killing the UK economy? I'm joined by, by uh, meteorologist Jim Dane and also social commentator Paul Burgess, who's a climate scientist. Paul, I'm going to start with you. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about this then. Uh, why are they doing this and is this, is this the right way to go? It's so wrong, it's unbelievable. I, I come from this area. 2,800 people. Mm. That's 10,000 families are going to be affected by this green madness. We have put up power prices, electricity prices, so much mm. that the, our, our industries can't survive. This is a deindustrialization on a massive scale. It really is. And it's being done in the name of this green nonsense about CO2. And let me just explain something. We're now going to have to, and it doesn't make good quality steel. So it doesn't make steel for buildings or structural steel mm. or for cars or anything. It just, it just makes cheap inferior steel now. So we have to import that from China then, do we? So now we have the extra CO2 of all the importing and given the jobs to China. China must be laughing. And on top of that, currently in the world, and I've got a graph here, if I called it Paul 2. Um, if, if they've we see the, Paul 2 graph, if possible. Yeah, there we are. Now, all the renewables in the world, they're the sources of energy now in the world, total energy. All the renewables are just 2 to 3%. So you've got a, a graph there, and it's got coal, oil, and gas. And yes, like a, and a they dominate. Sending. And the other ones after that are hydro and nuclear. Right. They, only in the top little bit. You can't really see in them. In the very top small. part of the graph. The very top, top part, little part of the graph. Now, that is where the energy is coming from. So when people say, you know, 25% of energy came, they're talking just about electric grid in the UK, mm. etc. If you look at the UK, we take 5 to 6% between five and six percent was renewable at a huge cost well i almost became a little bit upset there thinking about those poor families in south wales and all for nothing and don't forget the additional point what i'm making here is this it makes no difference in other words even if you accept their co2 argument what they're doing to us and to our industries make no difference at all as you can see from the graph that's been shown you know all those things coal gas and oil are all growing rapidly and it is has no meaning and all the conferences as we know make no difference at all to the co2 so even in their world it does not make sense to do this so the only the only value in doing this is so our politicians can puff up their chest internationally and say look what we're doing whilst the chinese indians and everyone else just laughs at them and they deceive people. Let me give you an example of that deception of the green thing. If you have a wind farm mm. or a solar farm, we supply 10,000 houses. What do people think that means? I'll tell you what it means, because they say according to Ofgem, according to the average house. The average house is 20% electric, 80% gas. So what every single wind and solar farm in the UK means, every one of them, is we, only, we can supply 10,000 houses, providing 80% of the energy is coming from gas. Right? But, the, but they would argue that, it, although it, to supply more houses, they would argue that that would give off lots of CO2. So their aim is to get to net zero, but, but zero you, CO2, zero carbon, and that this is their route but, to do it. Well, why don't they just tell the truth? We can supply 10,000 houses, providing 80% of the energy is coming from gas, and we need gas supply when, when we're not blowing, when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining. So we need 100% backup. So if we're going to build a wind farm in the North Sea, we've got to back it up 100% with the gas. There's no way out of that, by the way. And all the other storage techniques, and I've been involved with things like de Norwich pump storage, I've been involved with that professionally, all those don't even come near to it. On nine days in 2018, without power, 7,200 gigawatt hours needed. We've got 9.1. We need 7,200. There is no storage solution that can work. We, we are, we are deindustrializing on a massive scale. And I hope Jim can understand that his politics, his stop oil nonsense and all this, that politics is now costing us very dear. And it's very but, close to home to be. But, but he might argue, and I, as a lot of them do, that we are protecting ourselves on the planet and the planet itself. And without a planet, we're nothing. So we actually need to maintain the planet and our, ourselves on it. And therefore, we need to use techniques that mean that we do not destroy our environment. This is what they might argue. More CO2 is good. More CO2 is good. I, I really do love to one day to be able to explain to GB News. You know, GB News... You've got time. Explain to me why more CO2 is good, because right, most people are saying it's bad. Right, basically. OK. When you... It's to, do, it's, a, it's to do with some physics. Well, at this point, I'm expecting uh, Jim Dale to pop up in response. Um, I don't know that it's not there. And so I'm having to try to get my points in rapidly. 
Now when I'm asked this question, my mind goes, do I go to the Stefan Boltzmann curve? Do I get into that? Um, no, I can't do that. I haven't got any slides prepared that can explain that. Uh, if I'd have known about it in five or six minutes, I think I could get the message over. Can't do that, so I've got to keep this really simple and uh, try to get her in before Jim comes back on me. That's the way I'm thinking. <laughs> Which I'd need four or five minutes to explain. That's all. But I could explain it in four or five minutes. Can you do but it in three? I'll try. Well, OK. Can I explain it in three? So what's going through my mind there is, how can I get the message across in three? So first of all, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do a little excerpt now of a forthcoming video. And it's explaining the basic CO2 issue uh, with a little bit of science. And I'm trying to make it digestible to everybody. So first of all, I'm going to show you what was in my mind. And I'm going to show you how I answered it. So here we have the infrared um, curve. Now what is uh, the curve shows without any greenhouse gases is that all the infrared radiation from the earth, which has been, if you like, converted, the soil, the ground has been heated by the short wave radiation from the sun, but that gets converted to a longer wavelength radiation in the infrared spectrum here to leave earth. And this is how it leaves earth. It's called the Stefan Boltzmann curve. Now, at the moment, without any greenhouse gases on this graph, everything could leave. There'd be no greenhouse effect at all. The largest amount of heat will be leaving in this area here. You know, you can see it by the height of the graph. But as you get to these frequencies here, the higher frequencies, less and less heat will be leaving in those frequencies. So um, the greenhouse gases actually are important to give us a blanket, to give us some warmth on Earth that otherwise would not be there. So that is the effect there without any greenhouse gases at all. Now adding all the greenhouse gases but leaving out CO2, leaving out carbon dioxide, what happens? Well those gases trap heat and the blue area is the amount of heat it traps. So no longer is the Earth radiating as per the top curve, it's radiating as per the lower one with the green boundary on it, all the white area, that's what's that's what's leaving Earth less than before, and so we're retaining the heat. Right, so what happens when we start to add CO2? Well, I first need to explain how molecules of, di of the different greenhouse gases react um, to trap heat. The sunlight passes right through them. That doesn't trap the heat. What traps the heat is the heat being converted into infrared heat, as per the spectrum I've shown you, and rising up from the Earth. That's what gets trapped. But it only gets trapped in certain frequencies because a lot of the infrared radiation is quite transparent to the CO2 molecule. So the molecules, the different greenhouse gas molecules, get excited about particular frequencies. And in the case of CO2, it's between 14 and 16 wavelength. It's in that area. That's what excites it. Everything else just passes through it. It doesn't do all that excitement to hold the heat in. So let's look now uh, at the effect of this narrow band um, that excites CO2. Well, here you can see in this diagram, the CO2, the green part there, is what happens in a narrow band. Compare that to water vapour. Water vapour absorbs across a very wide range. And by the way, even in the range that green is coming, the CO2 absorption is coming and exciting the molecules, it has to share it with water vapour. So it is very limited in terms of the frequency band. Yet another property of CO2, it's very effective. It grabs the radiation uh, available to it very quickly, even a small amount of CO2. So even 20 parts per million, look, it grabs an awful lot. The next 20 parts per million grabs a lot less. And as you can see, it just dies down very quickly. So you get very small increases in the effect of CO2 as you add it. It loses its effect. And this is really important. And as you can see here, from pre-industrial times to today, the amount of extra heat that's been added is tiny. It was pretty saturated even before the Industrial Revolution. So in effect, all we've been doing is a microscopic adding of heat. That's all. Now, as before, we have the graph with all the greenhouse gases in it, except for CO2. So now let's add the CO2 and see what it grabs inside that 14 to 16 micron band wavelength. Oh, it's about 660 or so in frequency, same thing. So there it is in red. 
that's what the CO2 grabs. It grabs it with water as well. And you can see some of the water that's blue there above the red, that, that's grabbing that as well. Basically, it's so effective that it grabs what radiation is available and it can't grab any more unless you increase the radiation or maybe a little bit if you increase the CO2. And what it does is it widens itself out a bit, just a little bit. And in fact, to double from 400, say, to 800 parts per million, that red would only expand by about 1%. That's all. <sighs> The little table there showing the different uh, CO2 levels are very difficult to illustrate because it's a very slight widening. And as I've just said, 400 to 800 is only 1% more red. And no matter how much you pour in, it's like trying to fill, it's like trying to fill a hole with a bucket of uh, water and uh, you, you keep pouring it in, but you're not adding anything. It's next to nothing. And that is why. There's a limit and it's why the CO2 is not the control of the temperature that we think it is today. But without it, the earth would be pretty cold. So it is important, but it's important initially. After a certain point, even before the Industrial Revolution, it's lost most of its potency. Well, that's all the theory. But that's meaningless unless you can provide proof that that works in practice. But satellites can measure this radiation coming back from Earth. It can measure the heat leaving Earth, if you like, the infrared heat. And here is an excerpt from my video, More CO2, Please. That's a video I made a few years back. And in it, you can see the curves. And on the left, you can see what the theory is for the Sahara, a point in the Sahara, for the Mediterranean and for the Antarctic. So that first column is what the theory says. And look. This is what the measurement says. So we actually, actually prove the theory by observation, fundamental to all science, and a lesson that should be learned by climate modelists, really. Well, that just shows three points on the globe, and it assumes no clouds, clear skies. The result of this in clear skies is just for a doubling from 400 to 800 parts per million is just 0 0.7 of a degree centigrade. That's all. But with clouds, which actually are a moderator of temperature on the Earth, this will be far less than that. And no one knows just how much because no one's managed to model the clouds. So basically, we're talking about fractions of a degree, which won't harm anybody. But why then is there such a fuss about CO2? Because the fact is that this science, this basic Stefan Boltzmann curve, this science is accepted by the alarmists. What, where they differ is they say that 1% extra heating for that little CO2 red patch results in more heat, yes, a bit more heat, but that bit more heat results in more water vapour because it's hotter, and the water vapour itself is a greenhouse gas, so that causes more heat and so on. So they treble it. They treble it, which is absolutely absurd. They call this feedback and the feedback trebles the amount. So now when you look at things like the satellite record of temperatures that we measure over the Earth and the actual models, you'll see a huge disparity because they're trebling the effect except for one model here. And that one model is a Russian model that doesn't actually incorporate any feedback. Now, funnily enough, when you allow for the El Nino here, and this is showing it's reaching its peak November 23. We've had a very warm El Nino recently and still in it. That doesn't cause that extra heat there, which is significant, does not cause uh, um, extra runaway effects, in effect, extra feedback. And nothing could have caused more water vapour quickly than the Tonga eruption in January 2022. That put a huge amount of water vapour into the atmosphere. In fact, it added about 10 or 12 percent to the atmosphere. Yes, that could have caused some additional warming short term, but you know, that's an enormous amount. And yet the Earth self-corrects over time. That can have an effect for maybe two, three, four years. Nor does the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation here. These don't cause it. Oh no, it's only the little bit, that 1 percent extra, magically causing more water vapour magically causing feedback but every other source of heating no at this point it's also 
worth keeping in mind that the oceans contain a thousand times more heat than the atmosphere. The oceans heat the atmosphere. It isn't a case of the atmosphere heating the oceans. That's like would that would be like trying to boil a, a pan of water using a hairdryer. The natural thermostat for the Earth is of course clouds. The moisture rises like this and forms clouds. However, those clouds reflect the sun's radiation back into space and reduce the overall incoming heat, if you like, to the Earth. Yes, the clouds do act as a comfort blanket, as a bit of insulation down below. So when you're sunbathing and the cloud comes over the sun, you'll feel that heat immediately drop. The overall effect of these clouds is to cool the Earth. And that is one of the natural thermostats of the Earth. Suddenly I'm unusually given three minutes to explain what was in my head and what I've just shown you was in my head. I could have shortened that, of course, but three minutes without the preparation of the diagrams or some diagrams, etc., very difficult. So I had to do the super simple explanation and use the William Happer, uh, Professor William Happer's version of painting a barn sort of thing, painting a wall red. Here, here it is. So I'm going to take you back now to the show. Um, when you add CO2, the first 25 parts, 50 parts per million, takes up most of it, right? Takes up what the radiation there is. And as you add it, it becomes less and less effective. So it's like painting a wall red. Mm -hmm. If you've got a white wall, you put a coat of red on, mm -hmm. it's red. But if you put another coat on, it's redder. And another coat on, it's redder. But after three or four coats, it, it makes no difference. Yeah. So extra CO2. Now, this is the physics of it. Mm. Now, both sides agree. It, 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 the both sides agree on the science there, by the way. There's no dispute between me and the alarmists on that, the scientists. Where the dispute comes is they say, ah, but that creates more water vapour, because if you double it now from 400-ish, you'll get 1% more radiation trapped, 1%, according to the figures, which is 0.7 of a degree C, to go in doubling. But the clouds come in then to it, because that doesn't allow for clouds. And the clouds come in because of the extra water vapour. They don't allow for that. No one has successfully modelled clouds. So you're so, saying that the... the modeling that they have used is not considered external factors like clouds and Correct. The that they will have on the amount of CO2 released into the atmosphere. And if you look at the satellite temperatures, they're like this. If you then look at all the models, they're like this, three to four times more heating. But there is one model that's pretty dear. And that model doesn't allow for, for the extra thing. They, they treble it. They treble so, the so effect. So where are the IPCC and people like that? Why are they not explaining to us what, what their sort of calculations are and how their modelling works as to how they've worked out that it is CO2 that, in their view, is the enemy? Uh, they have. A, lo a lot of the physics has. There's a lot of good physics done by the IPCC, mm. but there's the physics and the science, and then, and then there's the political side, which is what the summary for policymakers is, and written by a representative from each country. It's a political document. So when I show, when I show Jim, for example, I've showed in the IPC saying there's no more floods, there's no si uh, science for that, there's no science for droughts, he goes, oh, you know, as if I'm offering a crucifix to Dracula sort of thing. But in actual fact, it's true. Uh, and, and the scientists said, look, it's warming too much, the models are wrong, they're warming too much. But that doesn't stop the politics. So the politics with IPC will, IPC will put um, a, a president of a, of a small island, Tuvalu, in, in a pool of water, in the, in the coral reef there, on a desk, and say, look, we're sinking. And when you look at the satellite, they've grown 2.9%. The evidence, and I'd love to be able to present this properly to, to viewers, and uh, you can, this is the only show on any television or radio show, this Narakua show, that allows my view to come across, which is we need more CO2 but so they, we're not they, damaging they would argue the planet. The, the, a lot of people are arguing right now, I mean, all the big major bodies are saying we need to reduce CO2. You've got, obviously, our approach to net zero. The governments and businesses are putting in big money for this. There has to be some truth to what they're saying, and a lot of people uh, feel that this is the reality. All right, then. Sorry. Sorry. So, but, well, no, well, well, quickly then, I've got Very quickly. Well, well why, why do leading physicists winning the Nobel Prize now join the association called the CO2 Coalition, which is calling for more CO2? Why are the leading scientists, and why don't they debate me? Why don't they debate well, people? Well they, well, well, they should do, and I don't know what happened to Jim. Jim was supposed to be debating you now, but I think he's, he's been entrapped somewhere. I think he's...
Where did he go? Is he on to Thailand? He flew. I think he would have flown to Thailand, obviously. Uh, but wherever he is, he probably went on a gas guzzling machine that took him there. Uh, but he, he is not available to talk to us now. We would really want us to get some balance. What are your views? Do you think that CO2 is the enemy? GBviews at GBnews.com or tweet me at GBnews. Paul Burgess, climate scientist, thank you very much. OK, so there we are. I've used the Nana Akua show appearance there to explain a little bit more about the main difference between the... Uh, you know, re realists and the alarmists. And um, when I mentioned, just mentioned the words, actually talking to Neil Oliver in the green room, when I mentioned the words, um, Stefan Bolsom Curve, um, Jim rudely shouted, um, no, that's not been accepted. Well, it has, actually. Uh, Jim does not understand the most basic things uh, uh, about these issues. And in fact, not to, to have denied the existence of that, never say it properly, to, de to deny the existence of the Atlantic multi-decadal ah, oscillation it was ridiculous because that's fundamentally meteorology. So one wonders about his knowledge on that. You know, now I'm not going to attack him on, on, on who he is. I am not. Uh, I'm, I don't even care what qualifications or lack of them he's got. What matters is the evidence, always the evidence. And I really don't want to be drawn into a slanging match on, on these things. Um, but, um, you know, so uh, I, I don't know where, we, where we're going to go from here. I'm just looking for more time to try to get the message across. Uh, I, I mean, having now watched Jim on the um, Farage show with the, with the lady taking Farage's place the, um, uh, since this show on Saturday, um, I, I just am baffled why he gets 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, uh, um, and in doing that, he repeated the Heathrow temperatures. He mentioned uh, me, uh, I, I think, by not by name, but by saying he debates with someone who cherry picks. He never gives evidence of cherry picking, by the way. He doesn't come back and say, well, this is the counter evidence that is opposite you. He doesn't do that. Um, so... I don't know where we're going to go, but my temper is getting short with him. And um, I've really got to expose the lack of comeback I'm getting um, on, on all this. Sorry for chattering on. It's about 25 minutes now, this video, so I better terminate it. And thank you all for all your comments. I really do appreciate them. I try to answer everyone. Don't forget, I'm answering not just the one video. I'm answering lots of past videos as well. So my time is limited. I have to try to answer uh, and, you know, just get it all done but unusually i do try to answer every comment and every one of my videos and always have done there we are thank you for watching again look forward to the next time bye